Today we will look at the temple at Anva, a small relatively unknown temple and see how the architecture of temples can tell us more about social processes and methods of building, of design, of the ambitions of kings, of how diplomatic relations between various kingdoms worked. We shall all do this solely on the basis of material evidence because we have no other evidence about this temple. Like a lot of sites in India, this temple has no inscription, no references in any texts, no copper plates. In short, all that we know about the temple is the material itself. And we shall study the material and try and create a narrative, try and create a history using methods that are acceptable to scholarship. The temple at Anva, in a slightly ruinous state right now, has been well studied but in superficial ways. Anva is situated in the Aurangabad district of Maharashtra in a cultural zone called Marathwada. Marathwada has been recognized as its own cultural entity for a long time now. This was also the heartland of a dynasty called the Yadavas, whom we will encounter soon after. But let us first look at the historiography of this temple, which is to stay, let us look at the history of studying history of this temple. This temple has been mentioned by several scholars such as James Ferguson in his epic History of Indian and Eastern Architecture. Written in 1876, there is a description of this temple, a description that will get picked up and copied later in several publications such as the District Gazetteer. G. B. Deglurkar, almost a hundred years later, mentions this temple in a survey called Temple Architecture and Sculpture of Maharashtra. Twenty years later, Prabhakar Dev also does the same when he has a monograph dedicated to temples of Marathwada. What is notable to us are the two publications listed in red, which are publications that deal with temples in this region and period, but do not mention this table, uh, temple at all. What this suggests is that this temple was not major enough to be included in every survey of the region. The temple st first starts appearing significantly with the building of the railways in the Nizam's dominions. The railways think that sites like this are important in promoting the use of the railways and this use for them will be mostly for tourism. But James Ferguson is the first one to reproduce the temple using drawings of Major Gill that he has in his book. He talks about this temple as an important temple built in the Jain style, a claim that gets repeated by scholar after scholar. So if you look at the extracts of what people have to say about this temple, James Ferguson first says, this temple is plain in the center and one of the most marked and pleasing features is of Jain domes which are similar to those of Vimal Shah in Mount Abu. So he is talking of this temple and saying it resembles temples built in the 11th and 12th century in Mount Abu in Western India. If you look at the revised edition of this book, you still have the same where it is compared to the temple of Vimala at Mount Abu, but you also have a statement that says, a greater and perhaps better example might be cited in the case of the great sun temple of Modhera in Gujarat. And if you look at the Maharashtra State Gazetteer, it also repeats the same claim, saying the temple at Anva is a fine specimen of the Jain style. If you look at the temple as it stands now, the domes uh, are really uh, caused by plastering over of the Sabha Mandapas. But if you look on the inside, there are corbelled domes, 
So the outer profile would not have been much different from this that you see now. And the plan is semi-open, which means you only have walls till about waist height, above which the whole Sabha Mandapa, the space in front of the sanctum, is enclosed by pillars, half pillars, above which is the roof in the form of corbelled domes. If you look at a formal description of the temple and you look at all the sources that we mentioned till now, you will notice that all of them mention that the columns are of different sizes. But drawings of the temple have rarely betrayed this. You can see very clearly if you look at the columns surrounding the big dome marked by the circle of the Sabha Mandapa, there are columns which are small and there are columns which are large. The outside of the temple has all the mouldings and bands expected of a medieval temple, including Kirti Mukhas, bands of Hamsas or Ghees, of elephants, and also all the mouldings which are named. The dome, as we mentioned, on the inside of the Sabha Mandapa is corbelled, which means it is not built out of true Wuzwar stones, but it is built by successively moving each course of stones slightly further till they meet right at top. This is a technique you find in the Sabha Mandapas of almost all Jain temples in this period. On the outside, the four Bhadra projections, the four major projections of the temple comprise of one doorway from where you enter, from the Sabha Mandapa, and the three niches on the three Bhadra sides of the sanctum have images of Vishnu, clearly suggesting that this was a Vishnu temple at some point, but later was converted into a Shiva temple. Now, coming back to the co comparisons for this temple, the Comparanda, like the temple at Modhera, you also have Yadava temples which are built in this period. Now, let us not forget that Anva is very close to the Yadava capital at Devgiri, Devgiri being later Daulatabad. And the Yadavas have taken it upon themselves to patronize this style called the Bhumija style, the Gondeshwar temple is probably the best known of the Yadava temples built in the Bhumija style. This is an unusual temple in that it's built on a high plinth with four smaller shrines and a big one in between. But if you look at the Sabha Mandapa in front, it is completely walled in. It is not semi-open. If you look at other Yadava temples, such as the one at Ambarnath, again in ruinous state, you will notice that the Sabha Mandapa in front does not have the semi-open pillar hall. It is completely enclosed. If you look at the temple at Satgaon, that is where you start seeing semi-open pillared halls. But this temple is closer to the lands of Gujarat. And so when people like James Ferguson keep comparing this temple to those found in Gujarat, particularly that of Vimal Shah at Mount Abu, it is not surprising because the best comparisons for this Sabha Mandapa in front with a semi-pillared hall all seem to come from Gujarat at this period, whether it's at Modhera or the Someshwar temple at Kanoda. And so there is no doubt that there is some stylistic affinity between temples in Gujarat built in the 12th century and this temple whose date we are unsure of. If you look at Anva, it's built right in the middle of the territory which has deck and trap stone, black basalt. If you also look at Anva, it's on a very major trade route from Ajanta to Bhokardhan. In this period, temples are not centers of finance, they are not banks. What they are, are important nodes on trading networks. So if you have two medieval towns that are important centers, Anva will be an important node between the two of them. Of course, the capital of the Yadavas at Devkiri would connect or be an important part in this network of trade and movement. Now, the Yadavas we know, who rule for a fairly long time, 
are very successful in the 13th century under one particular king, under whom they make the Shilaharas of the Konkan their feudatories, but they also carry out massively successful campaigns against the Chalukyas of Gujarat to their northwest, the Kakatiyas to their southeast, the Hoysalas to their south, and the Parmaras to the north. We have several Yadava chronicles which talk of how they have beaten all these kings and brought back treasure and loot. In fact, the greatest of this king, who carries out four expansions, these four campaigns into Gujarat, is somebody called Singhana II. Now, Singhana's chronicles are well described, and he rules for a long time, for over 40 years, and carries out major expeditions to Gujarat, in which he brings back everything that he can see. And one of the things we suggest that he brings back is an architectural design of a temple. He sees temples in Gujarat and emulates them, he copies them, not because he feels that he is subservient to the Gujarat Chalukyas, but because he feels he has he has been victorious over them, he's won over them. And one of the things everybody does when they win something is carry it back home. Jain temples in Gujarat are not mobile objects. You cannot carry home a temple. What you carry back instead is the design of a temple. And so after all these campaigns, he probably comes back and says, I want a temple built like the temples that I have seen in Gujarat, which I have raided and conquered. Now this kind of circumstantial evidence of this temple being built by the Yadavas in their own heartland, resembling Jaina temples from the Gujarat Chalukya's reign, coupled with Singhana's campaigns in Gujarat, starts providing a date for this temple. After all, this temple cannot be older than the Jain temples at Mount Abu, because there you see a clear evolution of how they've come up with the design. This obviously copies something that doesn't belong in this region at all, because there are no other temples like it. And so we can say very safely, this temple is probably from the mid 13th century when Singhala has seen a well-established temple type in Gujarat. If you look at uh, some of the bands on the outside of the temple, what you see are ascetics, something that you very much see on Jain temples, and other beautiful dancers and apsaras. Uh, but this motif together, which is found in Jain temples, is called the sadhak and the sundari. You have a number of examples of these, but what is also very strange is the figure you see on your top left, or in the center at the bottom, which are dressed like ascetics, which look like ascetics, but they are in a very strange pose, almost as if to make fun of them, almost as if to lampoon them. And this might be because this was built as a Vishnu temple, as a Vaishnava temple. And when you copy the design of a Jain temple, it does not have the same respect for the same Jain ascetics that you would find on that temple. But marginalia in Indian temples is yet another topic which deserves a separate discussion. Most importantly, the big circumstantial evidence of why this temple is built on a design that does not belong to this region can be seen in its architecture and construction. If you look at plans of this temple by scholars like Deglurkar, whom we mentioned earlier, you notice that all the columns are shown as being of the same size. And when I say same size, I don't mean in height, but in width. Again, if you look at other scholars, such as Kumud Kanitkar, all the columns are shown to be of the same thickness. Except for the archaeological report of the Nizam of Hyderabad, which portrayed the columns accurately, everybody draws the columns as though they were of the same size. But yet, everybody has noted that the columns are of various sizes and nobody has thought that this was an important detail. So yes, they see it, they describe it, but when it comes to drawing it, 
Ah, it's not important. They just draw it the way they like. But when you go to the temple itself, the smaller size of the middle columns is so obvious. You can see two columns with a beam on top and inside of them are smaller columns. As though this picture was not enough, here you can really see it. Ignore the concrete block support that was put in by the Archaeological Survey of India to ensure the structural stability. But what you see here is two wide columns with a beam on top. The beam has very obviously cracked. Because it was cracked, the Archaeological Survey put in a column of concrete blocks. But before the Archaeological Survey, perhaps as early as 20 or 30 years after the construction of this temple, those two slender columns were pushed into place to hold up that beam which had failed. And how do we know that the smaller columns have been inserted in later? Well, you know because if you look at the base of those small columns, they are rounded. And the rounded bases are because the column has to be slid in later and it can only happen when the base is rounded at the bottom. Now why is it that the temple fails, all the four lintels crack and all of them have to be propped up by these stone columns? It's possibly because you have two different types of stone being used in Maharashtra and Gujarat. As we said, Anva is in the basalt heartland and you have this dark black stone called basalt which has properties different from the sandstone that you find in Gujarat. So while the design of the temple is copied from Gujarat to Maharashtra, the material is not. But it is not just the material that has made a difference. It is also a difference in how the artisans who actually built the temple understood the design. So let us look at a drawing of the temple where you can see the sanctum, the Sabha Mandapa in front, columns everywhere supporting the Corbel dome on top and in between the big columns you have the small columns. If you look at the grid that the temple is built on and everybody should remember this grid because we've seen this in the design of temples. The thickness of the walls is a module of the width of the sanctum and the same kind of module is used for the Sabha Mandapa. In fact the whole temple is built on a grid of exactly the same module. If you look at where the domes are placed, the big corbel dome is in the center and on three sides over the entrances you have smaller domes. Now those small domes also support the same modular system of the sanctum and the corbel dome is supported on a ring of eight beams that are placed on the columns. And it is these four green beams that have failed and not the diagonal ones. And they have failed because they support the weight not just of the big corbel dome, but of two domes, the big central dome and also the smaller domes on the sides. And so, here you have it. Circumstantially, we think it's built in the mid 13th century. We know it's based on the designs of the Gujarat Chalukyas and we know that the temple has structural flaws. The reasons for this we think are material but it's also the technique of local masons and craftsmen. And so if you look at Jain architecture in James Ferguson's book, he gives a variety of ways in which the Jains will build a corbel dome on top of an octagonal set of beams which are supported by columns and he gives several drawings that you see here and the drawings that James Ferguson gives are like what you see on your left hand side. You have 12 columns and you have beams placed on certain of those columns and those beams form an octagon and you place a dome on it. Now artisans in Maharashtra in the Yadava heartland who have been told 
that they have to build a corbel dome supported by a grid of columns do not know how it's done. They are just told about it. And so what they've done instead is they have drawn a square of four columns and circumscribed a dome on top of it. As opposed to what the Gujarat Chalukya builders did, which was to take an, a square and inscribe a dome within it. And it is this basic difference in artisanal methods and habits that causes such a big gap between what happens in Gujarat and what happens at Anwa. At Anwa, because of a faulty understanding of the structure, the four beams on the four sides completely fail. As a result of which, you quickly need intervention in the form of small columns. Now, barely 70 years after the temple at Anwa is built at Devgiri, the Yadava capital, an enormous mosque as the Khiljis completely take over. And this mosque uses on its inside for the dome a corbelling technique which is very similar to that of Gujarat. And if you look at the plan closely, and these are plans from the archaeological reports of the Nizam's dominions, you will see that the way in which the dome is arranged on those columns is very similar to what you see in the temple at Anwa. This goes to tell you that artisans, craftsmen, builders and architects have fidelity to the region, to the material that they build in and also to the techniques that they use. The fidelity is not towards religion or the kind of architecture they are asked to build. Whether it's the temple at Anwa or whether it's this mosque now called the Bharat Mata Mandir, it doesn't matter because they are going to build in ways that they know best. And these ways involve local material and local construction techniques. It doesn't matter if a design is imported from Gujarat. You build in ways that you know best. And therefore, what this shows us is that there is a big difference between what happens as design and what happens as construction. We know that the design for both the mosque and the temple come from Gujarat. But we also know that they are both constructed by local artisans. Because design is given by people who can read and write, who are literate, who travel. It is a top-down approach to architecture. People who build do not travel as much. They are rooted. They have learned not because they can read and write, but because their father has taught them as their grandfather. And therefore, how they learn is through action, through gesture. Whereas people who come with designs are thinking about them. It's theoretical, it's philosophical. And therefore, these two traditions come from very different social classes. The designs are recorded in texts, but the construction knowledge is recorded within the building itself. We can read so much into this building because the building has a story to tell. We do not have the text, we do not have the inscription. There are a number of differences between this binary of design knowledge and construction knowledge. And all this can be seen in the temple at Anwa and the mosque at Dawlatabad. But here what is very important is to note that artisans will build for every ruler irrespective of religion, class, creed. Artisans will be true to methods of construction that they have in their own region, they will learn things from their grandfathers and so if a new design comes in, a lot of times they will not understand how the new design works, but yet they will try to build it using their own traditional techniques. Most importantly, what this case study should have shown us is that a piece of architecture can reveal a lot more than a text can. If we had a text that said this temple was built in the 9th century by such and such a king, we would believe it because it was written. 
because we privilege top-down information. We privilege the text. But here, in the absence of any text, we have the material speaking to us and material histories never lie. A temple has been put together by artisans and if you can learn how to read that and take that apart, you can learn everything about that architecture. Thank you.